Hi everyone, welcome to the second lecture video for this week for English 484W. Um, so I'll just get right into it, trying to speed these up a little bit. So I'm just going to get into my PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, in this second lecture, I just want to look at uh, these two texts that we read this week from Marie Calloway, uh, looking at them through the genre of autofiction. So autofiction is a genre that's become uh, strangely popular uh, very recently. There's been a number of autofiction novels uh, that have been published. So some of the authors that I can just list off the top of my head, uh, Sheila Hetty wrote a, she's a Canadian author. She wrote a book uh, called Motherhood. Um, there's uh, Karl of Nosgaard, uh, who's a Norwegian author who wrote My Struggle, which is kind of a multi-volume uh, retelling basically of his whole life. Uh, it's a massive undertaking if you want to if you want to read it. Um, uh, ben Lerner is another name. Uh, Maggie Nelson, the Argonauts. Uh, there's there's a number of, of authors who have been writing in this this kind of uh, genre of autofiction. And autofiction basically is just a combination of the words fiction and autobiography. So it's writing that kind of strays across those two lines. Um, it's using often the material of a person's own life as the kind of the material to, to write the narrative out of. And uh, but it's also incorporating a lot of fictional elements into it as well. So uh, there's often kind of very poetic language used or uh, certain details are really kind of looked at uh, in uh, under a really fine microscope. And um, yeah, a lot of it is just basically uh, focused on the act of memory even. So the, the recounting of one's life, there's always a little bit of a gap in that uh, retelling or remembering what happened and what actually happened. Uh, so even if I started typing right now, what's happening that I'm doing this lecture, uh, there's still going to be something a little bit that gets lost. Uh, you can't just recreate life on the page. But a lot of these authors are kind of trying to do that. And I think Marie Calloway, she definitely falls into this genre uh, using her own life or her own experiences as uh, the source material for these short stories. So I'll just get into it. So... This quote is from Roland Barthes, who's a French theorist, um, and I just have some photos of him uh, down below here. He's kind of a funny figure because he, in all of the Google image, image searches for him, so many of the pictures ever taken of this guy, he's smoking a cigarette or a cigar. Um, he, when he, I, I kind of wish that I could go back to when he was lecturing uh, and kind of uh, mid 20th century fr uh, France and where the lecture halls would just be filled with smoke because he would smoke for the whole lecture. Uh, I guess this is, I could kind of do that because I'm in my own house now, but um, but yeah, that was just kind of the, the time period. It's just funny looking at all these pictures of him smoking. But here's here's the quote that I think is a little bit useful for kind of thinking about auto fiction. So Roland Barthes had a very kind of famous essay that probably you'll read at some point uh, if you uh, if you studied English uh, or you keep studying English uh, called the author is dead. So that was basically kind of there was a lot of kind of liter literary criticism that would read uh, novels and try to ascertain details about the author's uh, personal life um, from from their texts. And Roland Barthes uh, his essay. Uh, was kind of putting, uh, a, or attempting to put a stop to that. So uh, saying that the author of, of, of literature is always at a remove from the text that they write. So there's something limiting getting any kind of real knowledge of a person uh, through the novels that they write. So, so that when, when we're writing, when we're interpreting text, uh, we shouldn't do that action where uh, we're switching between like a person's uh, biography and then their text and then trying to, oh, this person did this in real life. So that means that's why they wrote it like this in the text. Uh, he was kind of just trying to put a stop to that, basically. Uh, so just looking at the text itself and kind of forgetting about the author. And in this kind of quote, uh, 
even though he previously wrote an essay called The Author is Dead, he's kind of talking about how the author might kind of come back uh, into, into literary text. So I'll just read the quote. It is not the, that the author may not come back in the text, in his text, and sorry for the gendered language here, but he then does so as a guest. If he or she is a novelist, he or she is inscribed in the novel, like one of their characters, figured in the carpet. No longer privileged, paternal, alethiological, his inscription is ludic. He, I, I'll just read the, what the he, he becomes, as it were, a paper author. His life is no longer the function of his fictions, but a fiction contributing to his work. So that is, uh, that is one of the interesting, in this quote, uh, one of the interesting things about autofiction is that it's not so much that uh, real life is just being kind of sucked up into the literary text, but the literary text is also influencing people's real lives. Um, so there's different ways to that these kind of autofiction authors kind of uh, go about it. So at one point in, in the stories that we read this week, uh, or perhaps it, I was reading uh, an interview with Callaway where she mentions this, that she never kind of enters into an experience in order to write about it. Um, she just kind of experiences life. And then if there's something that kind of sticks out to her, uh, then she kind of has to write about it. But there's other kind of auto fiction authors, and one we're reading later in the semester, uh, Mir Mir uh, Mira Gonzalez, who have uh, said kind of the opposite, that they do kind of enter into kind of uh, strange situations that they uh, wouldn't usually enter into, uh, just for the, the chance that they could get something that they could write about. So that's one of the ways in which the literary text kind of also uh, fictionalizes these people's uh, real lives as well. Um, so there isn't a, a, a major kind of gap between the fiction and the life, but they kind of blur together. Okay, so but going back to the original definition of autofiction, I can, uh, keeping with the kind of the French theme of this uh, specific lecture, uh, it comes from a French author called Serge Dubrovsky. Um, so I'm just gonna read uh, uh, and the de definition that he has here. Um, he's talking about the novel that he published in uh, 1977 called uh, Fils, uh, which is the French word for son. And here, I'll just read, and there's a picture of him. The meaning of one's life in certain ways escapes us, so we have to reinvent it in our writing. And that is what I personally call autofiction. Fils is an attempt to write not an account of but an experience of analysis within one day of the narrator's life. It is obviously fictitious because it is a forced totalization. It is totalized only by the text. It is not a recapturing of my whole life in one day. So the essence of the book is already fictitious, although all the details in it are strictly correct and referential, as we would say. So even though there's kind of an experience reading perhaps the Callaway text that we're kind of getting a uh, uh, a very kind of realistic portrayal, almost like a uh, that we are almost there on this on these two kind of awkward dates or encounters between Callaway and these older men. Um, it it is the way that she writes kind of produces these encounters uh, with a certain like verisimilitude, where uh, it does seem just like uh, she's just retelling what happened. There's a kind of natural naturalness to it that uh, we wouldn't get maybe if we were reading a work of uh, kind of more literary inclination where uh, there's all these kind of metaphors perhaps that are going on or these abstract ideas that uh, the author is kind of incorporating into the text. Um, instead, we kind of just have what seems like a diary entry or something like that. Um, but that can be an illusion, which uh, Dubrovsky is kind of alluding to here in this quote that there is a lot of work that goes into writing autofiction, and Calloway especially, uh, I believe, is a talented writer. So there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes to give that kind of impression of, of this just being uh, kind of an account of everyday life. Uh, it takes work to kind of generate that illusion. Okay, so we're moving through this one a little bit more quickly. Uh, maybe that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so we kind of saw it in the in the criticism of Calloway 
uh, in the previous lecture where uh, one of the major critiques of her is that she's a narcissist. So everything in these stories is kind of about her. Uh, she's even kind of using these real life people in order to, uh, to generate her creative work. Um, so a lot of that uh, criticism, yeah, was that she was narcissistic. So uh, I'd be interested to see what you guys kind of think of that. If you think that this work is a little bit uh, narcissistic, uh, just in its kind of continual focus on Callaway. I mean, the, the characters that she meets, uh, so the Adrian Brody character and the Jeremy Lin character, there's, uh, there's not a lot of depth to them that's presented. They seem a little bit flat. Uh, are they, yeah, there they doesn't seem to be there. We don't really find out anything about these two people. Um, it's, it's mostly just the whole, both the stories are kind of just focused on uh, revealing how Callaway is kind of processing uh, these two encounters. So that's kind of where that narcissistic uh, critique comes from. Um, and I just have a quote here from, from Callaway. I know I'm reading a lot of quotes, but I think it's, it's useful, this quote. So she says in an interview with the Rumpus magazine, it's probably impossible to be a young woman on the internet and write stories with sex in them without being accused of being an attention whore. It seems an odd criticism to me in a way because every artist is seeking attention, like you said, to their work. I don't think of myself as narcissistic, but I'm definitely incredibly self-absorbed. I guess I wonder if seeing the world through the lens of yourself is necessarily less valid than other ways of thinking or seeing through. So I... I, I'd be interested what you guys think if there is an actually a difference between narcissistic and incredibly self-absorbed. Um, but I do think she is kind of pointing out uh, the the kind of what what she's trying to do with this kind of if it is narcissism, what that narcissism is doing in these text uh, texts. So this is kind of another aspect of perhaps the gendered nature of writing, but. There's a kind of writing that uh, it's kind of maybe the realist novel that aims to give the picture of society as a whole. So uh, there's lots of characters. They all have a lot of depth. Um, something about the kind of the zeitgeist of the times is captured in these novels that try to uh, contain all of society in them. There's often these kind of long narratives where uh, characters, uh, perhaps they develop, uh, they learn, but none of that is really going on in these two stories from Callaway, I don't think. Uh, connecting back to the Emma Young piece that I asked you guys to read, they are kind of stories of a moment, and a very kind of small, kind of micro, micro moments, uh, rather than any kind of picture of society as a whole. Although I think that's perhaps an open question still, whether uh, in these kind of micro encounters, uh, there's that old ex expression of seeing the world in a grain of sand, uh, whether you guys kind of got that impression from, from these two texts, whether there is kind of a larger representation of something perhaps like of, of gender uh, going on here, or if it is uh, following kind of the narcissist Narcissist critique, it is just about one person, Callaway, and her kind of, yeah, her, her self-absorption, her uh, inability to kind of give a character any depth other than herself. Uh, if you think even herself in these stories as a character is given any depth. And okay, so the final kind of little point that I wanted to talk about here is that uh, going back to the uh, to the Bart's quote. So the author comes back into the text and the way that that plays out in these two stories by Callaway is that she leaves herself open to exposure a little bit. So we do kind of see the ugly side of her. So these two texts, they are kind of... Um, in my reading of them, they don't really paint either Jeremy Lin or 
Adrian Brody, and again, these are pseudonyms. Uh, Jeremy Lin, the basketball player, uh, is not involved in the story, and neither is Adrian Brody, although that would make them a lot funnier. Uh, they're just uh, alternate names to sort of kind of conceal the identity of these two real people. Um, and if you are curious about who Jeremy Lin is still, uh, it's Dao Lin, who we'll be reading in week five and week six. So there's a little bit of a connection there. So uh, where was I? So yeah, so th these two characters of Jeremy Lin and Adrian Brody, uh, they do kind of get exposed and having kind of flaws, um, but so does Callaway. So like these two quotes that I have here, the first quote is from Ad Adrian Brody, and the second quote is from Jeremy Lin. So in the first quote from the first story, that made me both disillusioned in him and yet also sexually excited because he was betraying those values. So Callaway is participating in uh, this uh, man cheating on his on his girlfriend. And she doesn't kind of paint herself in like the the moral, the perfect moral light that uh, she feels really bad or anything like that. She admits that it, there is something a little bit exciting about it. Um, so yeah, she's kind of uh, portraying not so much a flaw, but I mean, she's not portraying herself as like as a perfect person or anything like that. Um, then in the second quote from Jeremy Lin, I found this is a, is a really funny part of the story. I wanted to cry so that so you would see that I was a good person and not a calculating user, uh, but he seemed completely unfazed by my tears. So in this kind of sentence, uh, like there's a lot of exposure of kind of uh, hypocrisy, uh, almost to the point of it being comedic. Uh, so she's being a calculating person by trying to cry, um, but she's admitting to the reader um, that this action that she was doing was to give the impression that she wasn't a calculating user. So again, it's not really exposing her as this kind of horrible person or anything like that, but um, she does kind of leave herself open to criticism. There is a certain vulnerability in kind of exposing your psyche to other people that I don't think everyone can do. So not so much narcissism, but I think there's a little bit of bravery here uh, in opening yourself to, uh, to, to criticizing or to seeing the not so great parts of yourself. Um, so yeah, I think these are kind of, yeah, this, this is just kind of pushed back against that kind of narcissistic critique, although I'm still curious what you guys think. Okay, and I'm just going to finish with another question. Um, so going back to that kind of autofiction being a split between autobiography and fiction, I'm curious what you guys think. What are the fictional stylistic elements of these two stories uh, that distinguish them from pure autobiography? So what kind of... Uh, what kind of literary elements are the are there in these two stories that make them not nonfiction, or perhaps you guys still, or perhaps some of you still view these stories as not really reaching the level of literature, perhaps still being at that level of nonfiction or a diary entry. Um, so I'm just curious. There's not so much like literary devices like uh, that are very common, like metaphor or anything like that. She has a very kind of flat. Uh, flat style of writing, uh, very kind of minimalistic. So it's kind of hard to detect uh, any kind of uh, typical kind of literary elements to these stories. But I'm curious what kind of literary literary elements you guys saw. Um, and perhaps that's playing with time, um, which goes on a little bit of the story. There's uh, uh, omission of certain details, perhaps. Um, I mean, there's, yeah, there's a suedo Um But yeah, that's the question that I have. And then just on the side, I just have a little quote from Callaway, kind of what I already talked about, that uh, there is kind of a lot of work that she talks about going into the writing of these two stories. They're not just like her sitting down uh, to just like vomit them out, uh, excuse the expression, but there's a lot of kind of work involved. And a lot of that work is kind of artistic work. So, so yeah, I'll just leave you guys with this question um, and I'll see you guys in the next video.